Chapter 151, Grindelwald's Unconventional Strategy Blake was incredulous at Grindelwald's audacity. The idea of Grindelwald establishing a school seemed ludicrous to him. Even if it were built with all the necessary legalities in place, Blake couldn't help but think it was a fool's errand. He was under no illusion that Grindelwald's enemies had all vanished. The notion that the school could be targeted and destroyed with a single fierce fire curse was not lost on him. Moreover, Blake's dismissal and the confiscation of his wand did little to dampen his spirits. To him, the Ministry of Magic's decrees were as inconsequential as a puff of air. He didn't need a magic school to thrive. Like Newt Scamander before him, Blake could easily traverse the globe, Tembra, his expertise in certain magical disciplines more than qualifying him to teach. Yet, his reluctance to leave was rooted in his connections to his friends, not a lack of freedom. Joining a school founded by Grindelwald, however, would cast him as an adversary to the entire world. Why would he engage in such a thankless endeavor? I refuse, Blake stated firmly. I'd rather go hunting with Hagrid than embark on such a venture. That's unfortunate, Grindelwald responded with a hint of regret. But your refusal doesn't change the fact that the Nurmengard Academy of Magic will soon be a reality. Whether they consent or not, I am determined to build it ensuring it complies with all legal requirements. Should anyone have objections, they know where to find me. Blake was taken aback by Grindelwald's confidence and his insistence on legality. It dawned on him that Grindelwald intended to wield the law as his weapon. The adage came to mind, fear not the hooligans skilled in martial arts, but those who can manipulate the law to their advantage. Curiosity piqued, Blake inquired, why are you so intent on starting a school? If you're as free as you claim and lack ambition, why not seek a peaceful retirement instead of pursuing such a thankless task? A smile played on Grindelwald's lips. You're concerned about me, Blake, he teased. Blake was at a loss for words. Grindelwald continued, In my position you'd understand. There are obligations that come with power, driven not by personal desire, but by the expectations of those around you. They've rallied to my side once more, seeking to benefit from my influence. Blake interjected. So, you're opening this school as a diversion? Grindelwald's smile widened, and he gave Blake a thumbs up. Exactly. I aim to show them that times have changed. Our past failures have taught us that if we wish to succeed, we must first present our ideas in a lawful and reasonable manner. Education is the most effective way to disseminate our beliefs, and a school under our control is the ideal platform. He elaborated on his strategy, explaining how the school would occupy his followers' attention and resources, preventing them from pressuring him into unwanted actions. All I need to do is maintain a facade of confidence and assure them that everything is proceeding according to plan. Blake sighed, impressed despite himself. Whether or not I believe your intentions, you certainly have a knack for strategy. After closing the book, Blake pocketed the newsletter. He hadn't anticipated Grindelwald's unconventional approach to his predicament. Blake couldn't help but ponder the timing of his conflict with Dumbledore. It seemed almost too convenient that as soon as there was a disagreement, an opportunity arose to poach him away. With the introduction of the communication book, the old handwritten notebook became obsolete. Blake speculated whether the glued pages might contain portraits of other voodoo members, but he had no desire to delve into them. As he stepped out of the room of requirement, intending to return to his dormitory, the system prompt sounded, detecting emotions of extreme regret, guilt, and grief. Ding! Congratulations to the host for receiving a diamond treasure chest. Blake's gaze shifted towards Dumbledore's office, intuitively knowing these emotions belonged to Dumbledore. Despite this, Blake continued towards the dormitory, only to halt after a few steps. Dumbledore, seated in his office, was visibly troubled, overwhelmed by regret and a desire to apologize, yet unsure how to approach the matter with Blake. Suddenly, a burst of sparks transported Dumbledore from his office to a beach, a stark contrast to the confines of Hogwarts. On the beach, Blake sat on a rock, quietly observing the horned camels that roamed the area. This is where the forbidden forest ends, Blake explained to the astonished Dumbledore. The first time I came here, I was amazed to find the ocean at the forest's edge, but the best part about this place is its privacy. Certain individuals, 
can't eavesdrop on our conversation here. Dumbledore, after a moment of silence, expressed his apologies to Blake, admitting his lack of trust was not about Blake's origins, but rather his lineage. It's because of Grindelwald's blood in your veins, isn't it? Blake asked, understandingly. Dumbledore was taken aback by Blake's insight, realizing his distrust stemmed more from his history with Grindelwald than with Blake himself. Blake's words struck Dumbledore deeply, revealing a young man capable of understanding complex emotions and motives. You're right, Dumbledore confessed, sharing his lifelong regrets and fears of repeating past mistakes with Blake, especially under Grindelwald's influence. Blake, turning to face Dumbledore, shared his own contemplations on the matter, revealing his choice to join Hufflepuff as a demonstration of his loyalty and integrity, aiming to prove his intentions to Dumbledore. This revelation brought a sigh from Dumbledore, who acknowledged his own prejudices and fears. You don't need to apologize. Blake reassured him, expressing his understanding of the complexities of human nature shaped by chaotic times. He emphasized his desire for freedom and autonomy, warning Dumbledore against any attempts to restrain him, especially in light of Grindelwald's interest in him. Dumbledore, moved by Blake's words and resolve, promised not to hold him back, acknowledging Blake's right to choose his own path. This conversation marked a turning point in their relationship, bridging the gap created by misunderstandings and opening a new chapter of mutual respect and understanding. Dumbledore had come to a realization. Blake was a unique individual, distinct from Tom Riddle or Gellert Grindelwald. Blake was simply Blake, the adopted son of the Dumbledore family, a close friend of Newt's commander and the most admired student at Hogwarts. Known for his kindness and lack of malice, Blake was a true Hufflepuff at heart. A week later, the wizarding world was rocked by astonishing news. Grindelwald had been released from prison. His release was not only legal, but had been approved by a significant majority of the International Federation of Wizards, including the Magical Congress of America. Despite Dumbledore's numerous attempts to prevent this, no one could ascertain the methods Grindelwald employed to secure his freedom. Even more shocking was Grindelwald's announcement on the day of his release. He declared his intention to transform Nurmengard, his former prison, into a school, he promised to offer an education in magic unlike any other, attracting students from across the globe. Grindelwald would serve as the school's first headmaster, with Vita Rothier, his loyal follower, as the deputy headmaster. Dumbledore was deeply troubled by these developments. He tirelessly worked to counteract Grindelwald's plans, but to no avail. Grindelwald's sentence reduction and subsequent activities, including the establishment of the school, were all within the legal boundaries set by the Austrian Ministry of Magic. Feeling defeated, Dumbledore returned to Hogwarts, hoping for a respite from the turmoil. However, he couldn't shake off a lingering fear, especially considering Grindelwald's previous attempt to recruit Blake. If Blake had harbored any ambitions, he mem, I'd have been swayed by Grindelwald's overtures. During this period of worry, Dumbledore received a letter from Grindelwald. The letter was a mix of cordiality and provocation, with Grindelwald expressing his delight at being freed and his new role as a headmaster. He even invited Dumbledore to the opening ceremony of his school, seeking advice on teaching. Dumbledore was infuriated and puzzled by Grindelwald's intentions. He suspected Grindelwald aimed to use his position to spread his dangerous ideologies. Meanwhile, Blake was reading about the developments at Nurmengard School in the Daily Prophet. Despite several attacks on the construction site, Grindelwald and his followers did not retaliate. Instead, they allowed the attackers to cause chaos, only for the Austrian Ministry of Magic to arrest them for disturbing the peace. Some resisted arrest and were swiftly dealt with by Aurors, who made no effort to conceal their allegiance to Grindelwald, as evidenced by the Deathly Hallows symbols they wore. Blake, however, remained detached from the situation, leaving Dumbledore to fret over Grindelwald's schemes. His attention was soon drawn elsewhere when Professor Quirrell sought him out, requesting a meeting in his office. Blake was curious about the purpose of the meeting, as Quirrell had shown no previous interest in recruiting him or teaching him the dark arts. Upon arriving at Quirrell's office, Blake discovered that Quirrell's intentions were entirely different. 
Quirrell revealed his knowledge of Blake's friendship with Newt Scamander and expressed a need for Blake's assistance. The nature of this request remained unclear, leaving Blake intrigued and uncertain about what was to come. Chapter 152, The Ultimate Destiny of a Mage Blake observed Quirrell's demeanor and had already formed his own suspicions. What kind of assistance do you require? He inquired, his tone sincere. If it's within my power, I'll do my utmost to help. Quirrell found himself genuinely touched by Blake's sincerity. In his eyes, Blake was the most familiar student in the school, primarily because Blake had once delivered life-saving hamburgers to him during a time of dire need. Despite the questionable taste of those burgers, they had indeed saved his life, sparing him from the grim task of hunting unicorns in the forbidden forest under his master's orders. Actually, I was hoping you could gather some information about the three-headed dog from Mr. Scamander, Quirrell ventured, his request catching Blake off guard. The directness of the question left Blake almost defenseless, yet it also made sense. After all, Quirrell was unaware that Blake knew about the three-headed dog housed on the fourth floor. This ignorance on Quirrell's part meant that Blake had no reason to be suspicious of his interest in the creature. However, Quirrell's decision to approach Blake was born out of necessity. The three-headed dog, a rare magical beast from Greece, had scant information available in the library. Moreover, Quirrell was wary of attracting Snape's attention by openly searching for information on such a specific creature. Learning of Blake's acquaintance with Newt Scamander, Quirrell saw an opportunity to obtain the information discreetly, as Scamander was likely to know about the three-headed dog without raising any suspicions. Blake, however, had no intention of letting Quirrell access this critical information so easily. The three-headed dog? I recall Mr. Scamander mentioning something about it, Blake said, piquing Quirrell's interest immediately. Really? Quirrell exclaimed, momentarily losing his composure before quickly apologizing for his overexcitement. I've been searching for information for so long without success, so I got a bit carried away. Why are you interested in the three-headed dog? Blake asked, feigning curiosity. Quirrell, reassured by Blake's question, explained his Ravenclaw-driven curiosity about the creature following a recent adventure. He expressed a desire to verify the existence and learn more about the three-headed dog, claiming that his Ravenclaw nature wouldn't let him rest otherwise. Understanding Quirrell's quest for knowledge, Blake began to share detailed information about the three-headed dog, including its place of origin and litter size. However, as Quirrell listened, he grew increasingly frustrated. Blake meticulously avoided discussing the creature's weaknesses, skillfully diverting the conversation to other aspects each time he neared the topic. This evasion left Quirrell feeling more tormented than if he were being tickled through a boot. Eventually, unable to contain his impatience any longer, Quirrell directly asked, What should we do if we encounter a three-headed dog? Leaning forward, he awaited Blake's response with eager anticipation. Blake, maintaining a straight face, advised, If you meet a three-headed dog, run. Quirrell was left dumbfounded, his question answered, yet his curiosity far from satisfied. Quirrell nearly toppled off his chair, caught completely off guard. Professor, what's the matter with you? Oh, it's nothing, just a bit of a slip hem. Have you ever encountered a three-headed dog? Blake asked, seemingly nonchalant. I can't keep facing such creatures over and over. Of course, my only option would be to run. Blake stated matter-of-factly. And what if escape is not an option? Are you just going to wait for death? Is there truly no other way? Quirrell inquired, a hint of despair in his voice. If he couldn't get past the three-headed dog known as Fluffy, then completing his task would be impossible. Well, it's not exactly like that, Blake began, piquing Quirrell's interest once more, who eagerly leaned in. It's like this. Every three-headed dog has its own unique weakness. For some, dancing in front of them might scare them off. For others, presenting specific herbs could allow for an escape. And for some, you might have to sing them a lullaby. The thing is, each Cerberus has its own vulnerability, and there's no surefire way to know, Blake explained. So, if you encounter a three-headed dog and can't escape, you're essentially gambling with your life. If you're lucky, you'll survive. If you're unlucky and choose incorrectly, 
it won't hesitate to pounce and devour you alive. Therefore, if you ever meet a three-headed dog, your best bet is to run as far as possible. Of course, Blake was fabricating. The only known weakness of the three-headed dog was music, which would put it to sleep. However, Quirrell was unaware of this fact. Upon hearing Blake's explanation, he groaned in despair, realizing the multitude of possibilities could lead to a sudden death. How could he possibly get past the three-headed dog? Was he really prepared to gamble with his life? However, if the three-headed dog is domesticated, then its owner would surely know its weaknesses. Blake added, seeing a glimmer of hope return to Quirrell's eyes. Indeed, a wild three-headed dog would be a gamble, but Hagrid's pet would be a different story. Hagrid must know its weakness. But then again, Hagrid wouldn't just divulge such information about the three-headed dog. Noticing Quirrell's distressed expression, Blake rolled his eyes. Actually, Hagrid is quite knowledgeable about magical creatures. You might want to ask him for more detailed information. He knows far more than I do. After all, he's always had a fondness for particularly fierce magical beasts. He's even told me about his childhood dream of raising a dragon, Blake continued, observing Quirrell's thoughtful expression. Blake's words had clearly made an impact. Though Blake already possessed a transformed black dragon, he believed the more, the merrier when it came to creatures like dragons. Despite the dragons in this world being relatively weak and frequently hunted, Blake was confident that, given the chance to evolve, they could become truly magical. Would dragon eggs end up in Hagrid's care? And what would be the difference between Hagrid's dragons and his own? Surely, as a fellow enthusiast of magical beasts, Hagrid wouldn't keep such treasures hidden. When the time came, they would tame the dragon right from its hatching. Blake was almost certain Hagrid would be grateful. Meanwhile, Bob was struggling with his charms class. Accustomed to casting spells without a wand, he found it challenging to meet Professor Flitwick's standards, especially since the spells in Africa differed from those in their current location. The wand is utterly useless, Bob declared, tossing his wand aside in frustration. Who says that? Blake objected, slamming his large wand onto the table. Wand's useless. Do you have any idea how many people I've knocked out with this wand? Bob's eyes widened in realization. So, the wand is for knocking? Of course, Blake exclaimed. Melee combat is the ultimate destiny of a mage. Picking up his wand, Bob wondered, Then, can I return this to Mr. Ollivander? Well, that's not necessary. What you need is to armor your wand, Blake suggested, opening Bob's mind to a whole new perspective on magic and combat. Armor for wands. What a brilliant concept, Bob exclaimed with palpable excitement. He was utterly fascinated by Blake's innovative approach to combining melee combat with magic. Imagine, if you're caught without a wand for casting spells, you could simply engage in close combat. Wouldn't that make you invincible? As they delved deeper into the discussion, they considered various designs for the wand armor. Perhaps wrapping a layer of metal around it would suffice. But what form should it take? A hammerhead could be effective, Bob suggested, his imagination running wild. Or maybe sharpen it into a spearhead. And let's not forget to add grooves for blue, dleading. Their animated conversation, however, was proving to be a distraction for Cassandra, who was trying to read nearby. Are you two designing a wand or a weapon of murder? She asked, clearly annoyed. Is there really a difference? Blake responded, his tone earnest. He explained that a wand in the hands of a wizard is as potent as a firearm in the hands of a muggle. The only difference is that wands aren't solely for attacking, they serve various daily functions. Enhancing a wand's combat capabilities doesn't hinder its normal use. Cassandra, unconvinced, argued, but we don't usually engage in combat. Blake paused, considering her point. You're right, it would be quite conspicuous in everyday situations. Suddenly, an idea struck him, and he began gathering various materials, grateful for the privacy of their secret base beneath the school. If they were in the library, Mrs. Pince would surely have expelled them for the commotion. Cassandra, curiosity piqued, abandoned her book to watch Blake's work. What are you doing? Bob inquired, but Blake was too absorbed in his task to respond. He's practicing alchemy, Cassandra exclaimed, her eyes locked on Blake's swift movements. 
Despite her efforts to surpass Blake academically, she found herself lagging behind in alchemy, a subject not officially taught at their school. Yet, the allure of alchemy had captivated her, and she watched Blake's work with keen interest. Blake's hands moved with astonishing speed, shaping metal with spells before Cassandra could even identify the material. Bob watched in awe, completely out of his depth. In mere minutes, Blake had fashioned a sleek, metallic wand handle. He took Bob's wand, replaced its original handle with the new one, and handed it back. Try it, he urged. Bob was impressed by the comfortable grip, though he couldn't help feeling that it resembled a weapon more than a wand. Sensing his thoughts, Blake instructed, press the button on the handle. Curious, Bob complied, and with a series of clicks, metal encased his wand, culminating in a small hammerhead at the tip. Waving his newly transformed wand, Bob was amazed by its perfect balance. Cassandra, despite her initial skepticism, couldn't help but admire Blake's mastery of alchemy. The transformation of the wand, from concept to finished product, had taken only five minutes without a single error and without the need for preliminary sketches. Such skill would be commendable in seasoned alchemy masters, but Blake had achieved it after only a few months in the wizarding world. Cassandra has always prided herself on her magical prowess, never feeling overshadowed by anyone, not even Hermione, Hogwarts's renowned top student. To her, Hermione's academic excellence was admirable, yet it never truly intimidated her. However, Blake was a different story altogether. His mastery of alchemy was not just impressive, it was overwhelming. In his presence, Cassandra's usual confidence waned, replaced by a sense of awe and a desire to learn from him. Would you be willing to teach me alchemy? Cassandra inquired, her voice tinged with a mix of hope and humility. Of course, Blake responded enthusiastically. Bob, why don't you go over there and play with your new hammer? Cassandra, come here, take a seat, he continued, gesturing towards his workbench as he stood up to make room for her. First, show me one of your best alchemy creations. I'd like to gauge your skill level, Blake instructed, his tone serious yet encouraging. Realizing Blake's genuine interest in helping her, Cassandra's initial apprehension gave way to excitement. She was determined not to let this opportunity slip through her fingers, recalling a previous occasion when Blake had eluded her request for flying lessons. Eager to impress, Cassandra settled at the workbench and commenced her alchemy with a focus born of a desire to showcase her talent. She decided to craft an alchemy bracelet, a seemingly simple accessory that kept the wearer's body free from dust. Despite its simplicity, the bed bracelet was a staple project for alchemy beginners, and Cassandra was keen to perfect it. Blake observed quietly from behind, allowing Cassandra the space to work while remaining close enough to offer guidance. As Cassandra became engrossed in her task, her determination to avoid any mistakes was palpable. Suddenly, Blake intervened, gently grasping her hand to correct a misstep. Soak it in cold water for 20 seconds before quenching, he advised calmly. Cassandra, taken aback by the unexpected contact, blushed but quickly adjusted her technique according to Blake's instruction. From that point on, whenever Cassandra faltered, Blake would preemptively guide her hand, believing that immediate action was more effective than verbal correction in the delicate art of alchemy. This hands-on approach, however, seemed to have an unintended effect on Cassandra, as her mistakes became more frequent. Amidst this intimate tutoring session, the secret door to the room swung open, revealing Hermione. The sight that greeted her, Blake holding Cassandra's hand, both of them engrossed in a seemingly private moment, prompted a surge of anger. What are you doing? Hermione demanded, her voice laced with indignation. The scene, ripe with misunderstanding, was a testament to the complexities of learning, mentorship, and the unexpected dynamics that can arise in the pursuit of knowledge. Chapter 153 a dragon's birth and hidden agendas. Cassandra caught sight of Hermione and slowly straightened up, a smug smile playing on her lips. We, of course, we are. I'm teaching Cassandra alchemy, Blake interjected before she could continue. But she's been making too many mistakes. If she doesn't correct them soon, she won't learn anything. Blake's gaze was piercing as he spoke, leaving no room for doubt. Cassandra shot Blake a resentful look. Can't you just let me have my moment before exposing me? She thought, frustrated. Hermione, meanwhile, glared at Cassandra, 
clearly unimpressed, then turned her attention to Blake, handing him a note. Hagrid asked me to give this to you. He's been looking for you everywhere, but couldn't find you. He guessed you'd be either in the room of requirement or here. Blake reluctantly released Cassandra's hand to take the note from Hermione, who was visibly grinding her teeth in annoyance. Upon reading the note, Blake's face lit up with excitement. The dragon egg was about to hatch. Blake had previously hinted to Quirrell that a dragon egg could be used as bait. This led Quirrell to extract the secret of how to bypass the three-headed dog, Fluffy, from an inebriated Hagrid. Overjoyed at acquiring a dragon egg, Hagrid immediately informed his friend Blake of the news. With Blake's involvement, Hagrid didn't need to scour the library for information on dragon care. What did Hagrid want? Cassandra inquired, curiosity piqued. The dragon is about to hatch, Blake revealed. Cassandra, having ventured into the Forbidden Forest with Blake, was quick to grasp the implications. Hagrid isn't planning to raise a dragon in his cabin, is he? She asked, a mix of astonishment and concern in her voice. Cassandra, you're such a clever girl, Blake teased, only to be interrupted by her realization. Wait, it's illegal to keep a dragon. Blake responded with a nonchalant, oh, which made Cassandra recall the various plants he cultivated in the Room of Requirement. Given the illegal nature of those plants, keeping forbidden magical creatures didn't seem far-fetched. Okay, I just realized. Cassandra sighed, resigning herself to the situation. Hermione overhearing their conversation was incredulous. You mean, Hagrid hatched a dragon egg? My God, has he forgotten his house is made of wood? Isn't he worried it will catch fire? Blake reassured her with a smile. Don't worry, I've taken precautions at Hagrid's cabin. With me around, Hagrid won't face the same problems as in the original story. Let's go. Don't you want to witness the hatching of a dragon? Blake's invitation was met with silent agreement from the group. Despite the illegality, the allure of witnessing a dragon's birth was irresistible. Arriving at Hagrid's door with Hermione, Cassandra, and a tall, imposing figure, they found Hagrid overjoyed yet cautious due to the legal implications of raising a dragon. Unbeknownst to him, Blake had orchestrated the acquisition of the dragon egg. Inside, the room was sweltering, prepared for the hatching. Blake had enchanted the walls and ceiling with fire-resistant magic to prevent any accidental fires, though Hagrid's beard remained at risk. Gathered around the dragon egg, a Norwegian ridgeback, Blake pondered if it was the same one from the original story. Regardless, the focus was on the hatching process, with Hagrid tending to the egg on the fire, mimicking a dragon mother's care. This isn't just about warming the egg, it's about replicating the nurturing heat a dragon mother provides, Hagrid explained, sharing his knowledge of dragon rearing with the group, their anticipation for the hatching moment growing. Raising dragons is no small feat. Suddenly, the door was knocked on again. Hagrid cautiously opened it just a crack, peeking outside before letting the visitors in. It was Harry and Ron. Given Harry's close friendship with Hagrid, it seemed inevitable that he would learn about the dragon. Hagrid, known for his inability to keep secrets, especially Fur, Om Harry, didn't attempt to hide the truth from Blake either. Suddenly, a series of soft noises emanated from the fireplace. Ha! It's happening again? I think the little one is about to hatch! Hagrid exclaimed donning thick gloves to carefully remove the scorching dragon egg from the fire and place it on the table. Everyone, step back, he warned. Norwegian ridgebacks are known to breathe fire upon birth. Blake echoed the caution, urging everyone to maintain a safe distance. Crack! Crack! The sound of the eggshell splitting broke the tense silence. Everyone watched in awe as the dragon egg on the table began to show deeper and more pronounced cracks, with something inside wriggling incessantly. Accompanied by a peculiar clicking noise, the eggshell finally gave way with a harsh scraping sound, revealing a baby dragon, which clumsily made its way out. The newborn dragon, though initially appearing somewhat unattractive like a crumpled black umbrella, was fascinating in its own right. Its disproportionately large, prickly wings contrasted against its dark body. A prominent, oversized nose adorned its face, with white nostrils flaring. Horn-like bumps on its head, not yet fully developed, and its bulging orange-red eyes added to its peculiar appearance. The dragon, curious about its surroundings, let out a sneeze, sending sparks flying from its nostrils, 
a clear indication of its fire-breathing capability. What a beautiful creature, isn't it? Hagrid remarked, looking at the dragon with adoration. He reached out to stroke the dragon's head, only to be bitten. Fortunately, the dragon's fangs were no match for Hagrid's tough skin. Oh my, it recognizes its mother, Hagrid exclaimed, surprised by the dragon's ferocity straight out of the egg, a trait characteristic of his next XX level magical creature, supposedly untamable. However, Blake wasn't so easily deterred. Hagrid, how quickly do dragons grow? Hermione inquired, her brow furrowed as she observed the dragon. Before Hagrid could respond, his face turned ashen. What's wrong? Someone was spying through the window just now. A boy! He, he's running back to the castle! Hagrid's voice was filled with despair. Confusion reigned for a moment before Blake sprang into action, kicking the door open and giving chase, with Bob close on his heels. Fucha! Blake shouted, causing Malfoy's body to suddenly hang upside down. What are you going to do? Malfoy protested. You can't cast a spell on me. Blake glanced around, ensuring they were alone, before a smile crept onto his face. Calm down, Malfoy, he said, waving his wand. Admiralty strikes. Malfoy hit the ground, nearly in tears from the pain. Let's have a proper talk, Blake suggested. I, I don't want to. Malfoy responded defiantly, only to be abruptly hoisted up by Bob. Shout again, and I'll separate your tongue from your mouth, Bob threatened sternly, harboring no sympathy for Malfoy, who had insulted his father on the train. Without waiting for Blake's command, Bob dragged Malfoy by the collar into Hagrid's cabin. Inside, the little Norwegian Ridgeback spewed a cloud of flames, singeing Hagrid's beard. Oh, you little rascal, Hagrid muttered, patting his beard before continuing to feed the dragon chicken blood. Upon entering the cabin, Malfoy realized everyone was staring at him. So, you saw everything, didn't you? Blake said, taking a seat. Malfoy nodded, then hesitated, shaking his head. No, green, I, I don't see anything, Malfoy exclaimed, his voice tinged with disbelief. Come on, how could you not see? Blake laughed, trying to ease the tension. Sit down. What are you afraid of? We're not going to use you to feed the dragons. At Blake's words, Malfoy's face drained of color, his heart pounding in fear. He wondered if Blake was being serious. The thought that he might actually be fed to a dragon sent shivers down his spine. Despite Blake's reassurance, Malfoy couldn't shake off the fear that Blake, with his devilish reputation, might actually carry out such a horrifying act. No, please I swear, I won't breathe a word of what I saw today. Malfoy pleaded, his voice laced with desperation. Blake listened as the system emitted a series of beeps, indicating Malfoy's frantic attempts to unlock treasure chests in a virtual game they were playing. The number of chests he opened quickly hit the upper limit. You really won't tell anyone about today? Blake asked, his tone serious. Really, I swear, Malfoy replied, relief washing over him at the thought of being released. Okay, let's go then. Blake said, gesturing towards the door. Really? You trust me, and you're letting me go? Malfoy asked, disbelief in his voice. Yes, the door is right there, Blake confirmed. Malfoy took tentative steps towards the door, half expecting Blake to stop him, but when he realized Blake was serious, he hurried towards the wooden door, eager to escape. However, just as he reached for the handle, Blake's voice stopped him cold. Forget everything, Blake commanded, his voice carrying a hint of magic. Malfoy's expression froze, and his hurried steps slowed. With a dazed look, he walked slowly back towards the castle, his memory of the event fading. Blake closed the cabin door behind him, turning to face a worried Hagrid. Blake, what did you do to him? Hagrid asked, his voice filled with concern. Just a little memory charm, Hagrid. In a few minutes, he'll wake up with no recollection of what he saw here, Blake explained calmly. What? Blake, casting a memory charm on a classmate could get you expelled. Hagrid exclaimed, his fear evident. Hagrid was deeply concerned about the repercussions of such an action. Having experienced expulsion himself, he knew the pain and loss it brought. He worried that Blake's actions, though intended to protect their secret, could lead to severe consequences. That's the surest way, Hagrid. Blake reassured him. If Malfoy had been truthful, I wouldn't have needed to do it. But he lied, and lying in front of someone skilled in lilimency is foolish. Harry, who had been listening, agreed with Blake. He knew Malfoy's promises were unreliable and had been ready to intervene. 
but Blake's decision to cast the Obliviate Charm had preempted any need for further action. But what if someone finds out? Hagrid fretted. Hagrid, for the safety of everyone here, I had to take this risk. If word got out that we were taming a fire dragon, it could have severe consequences for all of us, possibly even leading to expulsion or imprisonment in Azkaban. This could also be used against Professor Dumbledore, Blake explained, highlighting the gravity of the situation. Understanding the stakes, Hagrid nodded, though still uneasy about the potential fallout. Meanwhile, Blake turned his attention back to the little dragon, which had just spewed another burst of flame. He carefully approached the creature, ignoring Cassandra and Hermione's warnings about its bite. Hagrid had already suffered a bite, and they feared Blake might not be as fortunate. Relax, Blake said soothingly, his hand gently stroking the little dragon's head. Contrary to everyone's expectations, the dragon calmed down under Blake's touch, showing no intention of biting him. This surprising turn of events left everyone in awe, especially considering the dragon's previous restlessness and aggression. It drank eagerly, gazing up with an expression that seemed to say Blake was its mother. This sight tugged at Hagrid's heartstrings. The reason was clear. In front of Hagrid, Blake had managed to tame the Charmander, which now recognized its master completely and would never think of attacking Blake again. Ah, Hagrid looked at the Charmander, his face a mix of emotions, the little one seems to have mistaken you for its mother. But my dear, you need a proper name. How about Noble? Blake suggested with a smile, then paused. Actually, Hagrid, I just realized the Charmander is female. So, the name Noble might not be quite right. How about we call her Norberta instead? Blake proposed, and under his guidance, se, Norberta became much more docile. Despite being teased by many, she refrained from breathing fire or biting. Hagrid observed this transformation with mixed feelings. Despite his joy at Norberta's improved behavior, he couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness at how much closer she seemed to be to Blake than to him. Amidst the playful teasing of Norberta, Harry suddenly sat up, looking hesitant. Harry, what's on your mind? Is there something you want to ask me? Blake inquired, noticing Harry's reluctance. Harry glanced at Hagrid, who was still visibly upset, then turned to Blake and asked in a low voice, Blake, do you know who Nicholas Flamel is? This question marked the beginning of a deeper inquiry, one that would unravel mysteries far beyond the simple taming of a Charmander. Chapter 154, Nicole Flamel's Heir Blake looked at Harry with a mixture of surprise and amusement. It was unexpected for Harry to bring up Nicholas Flamel at this juncture, especially since he seemed unaware of who Nicholas Flamel was. Blake had assumed that by now, Harry would have at least heard of the legendary alchemist. Then it dawned on Blake that without Hermione, who often acted as the trio's repository of knowledge, Harry and Ron were somewhat adrift, lacking their usual source of information. Without Hermione's encyclopedic mind and the books she devoured for leisure, they were struggling to find any substantial information about Nicholas Flamel. Why are you asking about this? Blake inquired, his curiosity feigned to mask his understanding of the situation. I... I was just curious, Harry stammered, slightly embarrassed. Oh? Blake raised an eyebrow, skepticism evident in his tone. Harry hurried to explain. Well, it's not like I'm completely clueless about Nicholas Flamel. I saw his name on a chocolate frog card. The card mentioned alchemy, and since you're known to be proficient in alchemy, I thought you might know about him. Blake nodded, understanding Harry's line of reasoning. Harry had remembered the snippet of information from the chocolate frog card, but, without Hermione's assistance and the resources she typically accessed, he was at a loss for further details. Meanwhile, Hagrid was preoccupied with feeding Norberta, unaware of the quiet conversation taking place. The dragon, under Blake's influence, was reluctantly accepting food from Hagrid, who was thoroughly enjoying the task, and oblivious to the exchange between Harry and Blake. Since you're curious, I'll tell you, Blake began, seizing the opportunity to enlighten Harry. Nicholas Flamel is considered the most legendary alchemist alive today. He is known for creating the only existing Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone? Harry interrupted, his interest piqued. Yes, the Philosopher's Stone. It represents the pinnacle of alchemical achievement, 
capable of turning any metal into gold and brewing an elixir that grants immortality, Blake elaborated, watching Harry's eyes widen in astonishment. Immortality, Harry murmured, the concept taking root in his mind. Indeed, Nicholas Flamel is over 600 years old thanks to the Philosopher's Stone, Blake added, emphasizing the stone's power. Harry stood up abruptly, a look of realization dawning on his face. That's it. The Philosopher's Stone is what he's after. Blake stared at Harry, bewildered by his lack of discretion. Hadn't Harry been conducting a secret investigation? Why then was he shouting about the Philosopher's Stone, risking drawing unwanted attention? Harry's outburst did not go unnoticed by Hagrid, who, despite his usual slow demeanor, quickly grasped the situation. Harry, are you still looking into Nicholas Flamel? I've told you, this isn't something you should be meddling with. Hagrid's voice was tinged with panic, aware that this secret was not meant for students' ears. So the Philosopher's Stone is hidden here in the school, isn't it? Harry, realizing the cat was out of the bag, pressed Hagrid for confirmation. Hagrid, on the verge of a breakdown, pleaded, Listen, these matters are not for students to concern themselves with. Please, don't speak of this, or they'll think I've told you. Blake interjected softly, So, your inquiry about Nicholas Flamel wasn't just out of curiosity, was it? Harry, looking sheepish, admitted, Actually, I've been investigating what's being guarded by the three-headed dog on the fourth floor. It seems it's the Philosopher's Stone. Blake nodded, feigning casual interest. Is that so? You're quite the curious one. Now that you know, what do you plan to do next? I want to find out how many layers of protection there are in the room on the fourth floor, Harry said, determination in his voice. You don't need to know that. Damn, how did you even learn about Fluffy? Hagrid exclaimed, frustration evident. But, ut, I need to make sure no one steals the Philosopher's Stone. It's safe at Hogwarts, right? Many professors are protecting it. Harry reasoned, seeking reassurance. A lot of professors? Hagrid muttered, regretting his slip of the tongue. Oh, Merlin, can you tell me a bit more? Harry pressed, his anxiety about the situation growing. Because I'm not sure when Snape might. Harry began, but Hagrid quickly interrupted. Snape? No, Harry. Snape is one of the professors who set up the protective measures. You should understand now, Hagrid explained, trying to alleviate Harry's concerns. Professor Snape might not be the most likable, but he's involved in protecting the stone too. This revelation added another layer to the mystery surrounding the Philosopher's Stone, prompting Harry to reconsider his assumptions about Snape's intentions. The Philosopher's Stone is under the protection of Professors Sprout, McGonagall, Flitwick, Quirrell, and Snape, Hagrid revealed, his voice betraying a hint of pride. So you see, the stone is perfectly safe here at Hogwarts, there's no need for worry. However, Harry couldn't shake off his unease. Despite Hagrid's reassurances, the thought of Snape's involvement only served to deepen his suspicions. But, Hagrid, you haven't told anyone how to get past Fluffy, have you? Harry inquired, referring to the three-headed dog guarding the stone. Of course not, Hagrid boasted. Only Dumbledore and I know the secret to bypassing Fluffy. Blake exchanged a glance with Nobetta, his expression one of disbelief. He pondered silently on Hagrid's inadvertent slip-ups, like the dragon egg incident, but chose to remain silent. After all, Dumbledore's strategy seemed to be to let things unfold naturally, and Blake felt no inclination to interfere. As Harry and Ron departed from Hagrid's cabin, their resolve was firm. We have to act. Snape will surely try again, Harry declared, with Ron nodding in agreement. Imagine possessing the Philosopher's Stone, Harry mused. Endless wealth and eternal life. It's tempting for anyone. Ron's eyes sparkled with realization as Harry recounted seeing Snape's leg wound, evidence of an encounter with Fluffy, and Snape's confrontation with Professor Quirrell. They deduced that Snape was likely pressuring Quirrell to reveal his part in the stone's protection. Even if Quirrell gives in, Snape still can't get past Fluffy without knowing the secret, Ron pointed out, trying to find solace in the thought. Meanwhile, Dumbledore had summoned Blake for a discussion. I believe your portal can target specific individuals, correct? Dumbledore inquired, to which Blake nodded. With a flick of his hand, Blake opened a portal to Newt, who was visibly startled but quickly warmed up to their presence. Blake, Dumbledore, you're going to love this, Newt exclaimed. 
they stepped through the portal onto an unnamed island in the Atlantic, concealed from both muggles and wizards alike by advanced magic. This place is incredible, Blake remarked, taking in the beauty of their secret refuge. The narrative had been refined for clarity, removing redundancies and enhancing the flow of events. Descriptive details were added to enrich the setting and character interactions, ensuring a more engaging and coherent story. The beauty of the island was undeniable. At its heart stood a towering mountain, its summit crowned with a ring of snow that Blake could see even from a distance. A small river, its waters clear and unfrozen despite the cold, wound its way from the mountain's base, providing the island with an abundant supply of fresh water. Are you sure there are no other residents on this island? Blake asked, his concern evident. Dumbledore responded with unwavering confidence. Of course, I'm sure. Otherwise, I wouldn't have chosen this place. And with my concealment magic in place, this island has vanished from all maps. Unless someone has explicit permission, it's impossible for them to discover or enter this location. Well, except through your portal, of Ko, Ursi. Blake found himself growing fond of the island, and Newt Scamander was already enamored with it. Even a wooden house, ready for habitation, stood waiting for them. Mr. Scamander, are you planning to return home now? Blake inquired. Newt, cheeks flushed with excitement, replied, Ah, this could be a wonderful secret base. Blake nodded, understanding the unspoken woes of a married man, which seemed to reinvigorate Newt. Right then, I'm going to start remodeling the island immediately. Once I'm done, it will be a sanctuary where any magical creature can find a suitable habitat. Newt declared, his enthusiasm palpable. Blake, surprised, asked, You can use the untraceable stretch charm outdoors as well? Dumbledore chuckled. Actually, once my concealment spell enveloped the island, it became a defined space. In such a space, it's perfectly natural to use the untraceable stretch charm to expand it. Newt added, to cast the untraceable stretch charm over such a vast area, only you, Albus, could manage such a feat. Dumbledore modestly deflected. You're too humble, Newt. Your mastery of the untraceable stretching charm is unparalleled. When you altered the environment in specific areas, it was as if you were weaving the charm into the very fabric of the island. Newt, despite his age, blushed at Dumbledore's praise. Leaving Newt to his work, Dumbledore began to show Blake around the island, sharing another piece of news. I have good news for you, Blake. Nicholas Flamel has decided to continue living and has requested the return of the Philosopher's Stone. This means we won't lose a master alchemist anytime soon. Blake was overjoyed. Is that true? That's wonderful news. Dumbledore continued. He also mentioned that if you have any questions, you should ask them soon. They're eager to embark on a new adventure. It's a relief to know their journey has merely been postponed. Blake was thrilled. His plan had succeeded beyond his expectations. Nicholas Flamel's decision to live meant that the study of alchemy would not stagnate, and the opportunity to examine the Philosopher's Stone, a pinnacle of alchemical achievement, was too enticing to ignore. However, Blake knew the stone's current limitations in brewing the elixir of life. It could sustain life, but not vitality. An improved version of the Philosopher's Stone was not just desirable but necessary. Dumbledore then mentioned, For the safety of Nicholas and his wife, as well as the Philosopher's Stone, I plan to cast a loyalty charm on their house. And when I asked Nicholas who he wanted as the secret keeper for their safe house, Blake locked eyes with Dumbledore, anticipation and curiosity mingling in his gaze, waiting for Dumbledore to reveal the chosen guardian of such a significant secret. Would you say it was me? Blake asked, perplexed. Yes, he wants you as his secret keeper, Dumbledore replied, his voice carrying a weight of certainty. But why? Mr. Flamel and I have only ever communicated through the double-sided mirror. Blake's confusion was evident. The idea of being so trusted by someone he had never met in person was baffling to him. Why would they choose me to be their secret keeper? If they harbored any ill intentions, wouldn't that put them at risk? Dumbledore looked at Blake, his eyes twinkling with a mixture of wisdom and amusement. Don't you understand yet, Blake? Only you can reveal their location to others. This signifies that they see you as their successor. Successor? To what? Blake's surprise was palpable. The thought of being considered a successor, whether in terms of knowledge or wealth, was overwhelming. 
It felt as though his emotions were a treasure chest ready to burst open, a chest that could only be contained by the rarest of diamonds. Dumbledore's revelation hinted at a profound trust and expectation placed upon Blake, suggesting that his role in this mysterious legacy was far greater than he had imagined. The notion of being a successor, chosen by individuals of such significance as Flamel, suggested a path laden with both immense responsibility and unparalleled opportunity. Chapter 155 Hagrid, Merlin's Beard, This Place is Heaven! Three days had swiftly passed, and for Blake, who felt each moment stretching out interminably, receiving a note from Dumbledore was like a breath of fresh air. Without even pausing for dinner, he dashed straight to the designated toilet stall and opened the portal to that enchanting island. The transformation the island had undergone in just three days was remarkable. Newt's once modest cabin had evolved into an attractive, welcoming home. However, Blake noticed that the usual brightness in Newt's demeanor seemed somewhat dimmed. Before Blake could voice his concern, Tina emerged from the house and instantly, the reason for Newt's subdued mood became clear. The secret sanctuary had been discovered. Tina said she liked it here, so she decided to move the family, Blake remarked, a hint of amusement in his voice upon seeing Newt's forlorn expression. She's worried about you, Mr. Scamander. Think about it. Leaving you isolated on this island would be unsettling for her. Newt sighed in resignation. You're right, of course, but I still feel I'm not that old. For wizards who often led extraordinarily long lives, Newt's age was indeed not considered advanced. The previous headmaster of Hogwarts, Armando Dippet, had lived to the ripe age of 355. Perhaps she simply wanted to offer you companionship, Blake suggested gently. Tina, overhearing the conversation, chimed in with a playful tone. Ah, you're so cheeky, Blake. I'm not here just to keep the old man company. Despite her words, the sparkle in her eyes betrayed her true feelings. Blake's magical abilities greatly facilitated the relocation of the magical creatures. With a simple drawing of a circle, he created a vast portal through which the creatures could be transported to environments specifically tailored to their needs. This not only avoided potential conflicts among the magical animals, but also ensured their well-being. Many of the creatures rescued from the Colosseum had been returned to their natural habitats, while those deemed too dangerous were relocated to the island under Newt's care. The process was swift and efficient, thanks to thorough preparation, transforming the once tranquil island into a bustling sanctuary. Mr. Scamander, how do you plan to manage all these magical creatures? Blake inquired, concerned about the daunting task of caring for the numerous, often ferocious animals. Newt responded with a smile, showcasing the wonders of magic. With a wave of his wand, wooden barrels filled with various types of food flew from the house, distributing meals to the creatures before neatly returning to their original place. Blake couldn't help but express his admiration for Newt's ingenious solution. Newt then led Blake to a large grassland, a comfortable environment that could accommodate a variety of magical animals. Here, Blake's own formidable pets, including a mighty black dragon and venomous leopards, roamed freely. Newt assured Blake that the area could be expanded to accommodate any future additions to his collection of magical creatures. Despite Blake's assurances that he would manage his pets himself, Newt couldn't shake off the unnerving feeling that the creatures were sizing him up as potential prey whenever he assisted with their care. It was a relief, then, that Blake had taken on this responsibility, ensuring the safety and well-being of all inhabitants of this magical haven. Blake cherished the vast prairie, a significant upgrade from the cramped basement Newt had initially provided for the creatures. Utilizing the untraceable stretching curse to its fullest, he created a spacious haven. However, Blake was aware that this idyllic setting wasn't suitable for the long-term needs of the ferocious animals under his care. The absence of conflict meant they could potentially lose their fighting spirit, a fate Blake was determined to avoid. To counter this, he planned to craft several high-quality Pokeballs, intending to capture the creatures and stimulate their evolute ion through battles within their dreams. This innovative approach also served a dual purpose. It prevented Newt from discovering the animals were temporarily missing. The situation with Noberta, the fire dragon, highlighted the urgency of Blake's plans. 
Noberta's rapid growth posed a significant risk, nearly leading to the destruction of Hagrid's wooden cabin due to her fiery nature. During a visit to Hagrid, Blake and his friends faced the difficult task of convincing him that Noberta needed a new home. Hagrid, deeply attached to the dragon, was initially resistant but was eventually swayed by the argument that Noberta deserved to experience the vastness of the sky. The group contemplated various options for Noberta's relocation. Harry suggested sending her to Charlie, Ron's brother, who was an expert in dragon care. However, Blake proposed an alternative solution, revealing that he had recently acquired a special place for housing dangerous magical creatures, a location provided by Professor Dumbledore himself. This revelation sparked a mix of surprise and concern among the group as they pondered the implications of housing a dragon in such a facility. Blake assured them that Dumbledore was well aware of the nature of the creatures he intended to keep, implying that the inclusion of a dragon like Noberta wouldn't be out of the question. However, he urged everyone to keep this arrangement a secret given the potentially controversial nature of housing forbidden magical animals. The conversation then shifted to the logistical challenge of transporting Noberta to Blake's facility. The group quickly dismissed the idea of using apparition due to its impracticality with a creature of Noberta's size and the fact that none of them were skilled in the magical technique. Blake then teased the possibility of an alternative method of teleportation, sparking curiosity and skepticism among his friends. He hinted at a solution that didn't rely on traditional methods like apparition or port keys, leaving the group intrigued about the innovative approach he had in mind for relocating Noberta. Didn't I say it? Just send it directly, Blake said, raising his hand to draw a circle in the air. Sparks flew, and a giant dimensional portal appeared on one wall of Hagrid's cabin. Everyone except for Bob, who had previously seen a dimensional gate, was shocked by the sight of the sparking portal. It was undeniable that this was a portal, especially since they could clearly see a vast grassland through it. Nobetta, driven by instinct, excitedly crawled into the portal. The others watched as she unsteadily flew up in the grassland. Blake followed closely behind, stepping into the portal. He turned around to welcome his friends. Friends, welcome to my ranch, he announced. Blake observed Cassandra and Hermione, who were stunned, as he happily harvested a treasure chest on the vast grassland. All of Blake's powerful pets were there, obedient due to Blake's constraint order. They glanced coldly at Nobeta and Hagrid before going about their own business. To these rebellious creatures, everyone but Blake was considered insignificant. Even Agcarius seemed somewhat influenced by the environment, appearing older than before. Only Xiang Da remained as cheerful as ever. Upon seeing Blake, it grinned and ran over for a veritable bear hug. Ooh, I want to eat honey. Xiangda seemed to say, It's already ready, Blake responded, placing a large can of honey in front of it. While the others watched in shock, Hagrid felt overwhelmed by what he saw, a familiar giant bear, a majestic black dragon with smoke trailing from its nostrils, a living chimera lying nearby, a horned camel that clearly was the king of its kind, and to his astonishment, a cat leopard, and a shiaku with a special round face. Hagrid had never seen such rare creatures with his own eyes before. Are these your pets, Blake? Hagrid asked, barely containing his excitement. Of course, Hagrid. As you know, I have a preference for magical animals that are on the ferocious side. D, Blake replied proudly. Hagrid's expression was one of sheer fascination. May I take a closer look at them? Of course, but you have to be careful. They're not too fond of, well, getting too intimate with other species, Blake warned. I know, I know, they're all charming and proud creatures, aren't they? Hagrid said, understandingly. Hagrid, what do you think of my ranch? Blake inquired. How? Oh, Blake, your ranch is heaven, Hagrid exclaimed. At this moment, Harry and Ronald couldn't help but back away, wishing they could run if only the portal hadn't disappeared. Every animal here even the fiery red giant bear that seemed silly appeared more ferocious than the Lu Wei. The terrifying presence of these creatures was indescribable to the first-year wizards. Hermione's legs felt weak as she asked, When did you acquire so many powerful pets? Mr. Newt Scamander, Professor Dumbledore, and I took down a poaching ring at Christmas and rescued them, Blake explained nonchalantly, as if it were an everyday occurrence. 
To everyone else, this sounded like an incredible adventure. The idea of spending Christmas battling poachers and rescuing a group of ferocious magical animals only to tame them seemed like something out of a dream. Sorry, I feel like I might be dreaming. Oh, what a weird dream. Ouch! Ronald began, only to be pinched by Harry. It doesn't seem like a dream. You know it hurts, don't you? Harry pointed out. Ronald shot Harry a resentful look. Meanwhile, Nagini slithered over, spat, and softly licked Blake's hand. Blake spoke in a slightly apologetic tone. Sorry, Nagini. We... Harry stood amidst the group, his revelation hanging in the air like a dense fog. I haven't figured out a way to accurately divide the soul. So, for now, you'll have to remain as you are, he said, addressing the room, but his gaze lingered on a particular presence. A hissing sound filled the silence, carrying a message only Harry could understand. I want to be by your side. You can't follow me for the time being, Nagini. Please, be obedient, Harry responded, his voice laced with a hint of regret. Surprised by the exchange, Harry turned to Blake and asked, Blake, can you understand her too? The question seemed to echo in the room, drawing everyone's attention except for Hagrid and Bob. Their gazes, filled with curiosity and a touch of suspicion, turned towards Harry. Cassandra, with a squint, probed further. You mean, you can understand her? Is that so? Yeah, it's not that strange. Can't Blake understand? I thought many of you could, Harry replied, his innocence failing to mask the undercurrent of tension. Blake chuckled, breaking the momentary silence. Actually, I can understand all animals. Can you understand all animals too? No, I can only understand snakes, Harry admitted, his honesty stark against the backdrop of disbelief. Blake feigned shock, his eyes widening. What? Only snakes? Could it be? Are you a parcel tongue? Confusion flickered across Harry's face. A what now? Parcel tongues are often dark wizards. Could it be? Blake's voice trailed off, his expression a mix of shock and intrigue. The room seemed to freeze, every eye locked on Harry. The weight of the accusation hung heavily in the air. I... I'm a dark wizard? I'm not. I haven't been. Harry stammered, his words faltering under the weight of his own confusion and the sudden scrutiny. The moment was charged with tension, misunderstandings weaving a complex web around Harry's simple admission. His ability, a rare gift, had suddenly cast him in a shadow of doubt among his peers, challenging his identity and forcing him to confront the prejudices and fears associated with the legacy of Parseltongue. Chapter 156 The Revelation of Parseltong Seeing Harry still looking aggrieved and puzzled, Ronald couldn't help but say, Harry, you know who is a parcelmouth. Hearing this, Harry felt as if he had been struck by lightning. The words of the sorting hat echoed in his ears once more. Perhaps Slytherin would have been the right house for your talents. Harry was in disbelief. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. At that moment, a series of system prompts sounded in Blake's mind. Alert! Detecting emotions of panic. Congratulations to the host for obtaining a golden treasure chest. Today's limit for treasure chest drops has been reached. Blake stepped forward, placing a comforting hand on Harry's shoulder. Oh Harry, perhaps I wasn't clear enough. Parcelmouths are often associated with dark wizards. Harry looked at Blake dejectedly. Was that supposed to be comforting? Blake cleared his throat. Well, generally, yes, but there are exceptions. Really? Harry asked, hope flickering in his eyes. Absolutely, and you, Harry, are that exception. Me? Yes. Are you a dark wizard? Of course not. Then you're the exception, Blake concluded, spreading his hands. Harry looked at Blake, a mix of confusion and realization dawning on him. Though something still felt off, he couldn't argue with Blake's logic. After a moment of silence, Harry spoke up. But why do I have the ability to speak parcel tongue? I thought everyone could, Ronald interjected. No, Harry, not everyone has this ability. The most notorious parcel mouth in recent times is Voldemort himself. Harry shot Ronald a resentful look. Thanks for the clarification, but let's not make a habit of it. Blake, observing the scar on Harry's forehead, ventured a guess. It might be related to that. When Voldemort's curse rebounded off you, some of his magic, his essence, might have transferred to you. That's why you've inherited abilities from Voldemort without anyone realizing it. Unbeknownst to you, you became a horcrux, harboring a piece of his soul intertwined with your own. Blake mused about the possibility of examining Harry's soul more closely, 
but decided the timing wasn't right. Harry felt a sense of relief wash over him after Blake's explanation. The last thing he wanted was any connection to Slytherin House or Voldemort. The idea that his ability might be an unintended consequence rather than a sign of dark affinity allowed him to breathe easier. Suddenly, Harry turned to Blake with a request. Blake, could you do me a favor? What is it? Blake asked. Do you remember what I said about the Philosopher's Stone? Of course I remember. Then, could you help me protect it? Harry asked earnestly. He had always admired Blake's ability to handle any situation with calm and intelligence, even when facing challenges like Snape's unfair treatment. Blake's sense of justice and his ability to inspire loyalty in creatures like the ones Hagrid cared for only increased Harry's respect for him. Harry believed that with Blake's help, they could prevent Snape or anyone else from stealing the Philosopher's Stone. It was clear to Harry that Blake, with his strong moral compass, would be an invaluable ally. Excuse me, I refuse, Blake said abruptly. Harry felt as though he had been physically struck, his hopes dashed in an instant. Blake reassured Harry with a firm tone, The Philosopher's Stone is very safe, Harry. No one in this world can steal it. He knew the real Philosopher's Stone had long been securely returned to Nicholas Flamel's safekeeping, protected by a potent spell of courage and loyalty. As its guardian, Blake was confident in its safety, as long as he didn't divulge its location to anyone. Despite his assurances, Harry remained unconvinced, particularly concerned about Snape's involvement. Stop blaming Snape for everything, Harry, Blake chided gently. While I concede that Snape can be seen as a spiteful, scheming, petty, arrogant, and unkempt man who seems to disdain personal hygiene, it doesn't automatically make e him responsible for every misfortune. At that moment, a certain professor in a distant underground classroom sneezed repeatedly, glaring at the potion in front of him now tainted with his own saliva. Blake continued, Even if you distrust Snape, you should at least trust Professor Dumbledore. He must have compelling reasons for his trust in Snape. Harry, however, couldn't shake off his suspicion, still viewing Snape with a villainous lens. After their discussion, Hagrid saw Blake and the others off, expressing a wish to visit Blake's ranch again, though Blake couldn't promise when. He planned to craft more Pokeballs and evolve the creatures on his ranch, meaning Hagrid wouldn't find the magical animals he hoped to see on a future visit. Blake had said all he could, to ease Harry's worries. Now, it was up to Harry to decide what to believe. Blake had no intention of being drawn into any further schemes orchestrated by Dumbledore. That night, Blake visited the Room of Requirement again, contemplating relocating all magical creatures to his ranch while leaving the magical plants temporarily. Sitting in front of the log cabin within the room, he reflected on his recent acquisitions and opened his system space to review his inventory, which included two diamond treasure chests, among other lower-tier chests. Blake mused over the rarity of obtaining treasure chests through his adventures, acknowledging that even for Harry and his friends, securing a gold-level chest had become a challenge due to their familiarity with Blake's extraordinary capabilities. Deciding not to chase after the elusive supreme treasure chest, Blake opted to open the two diamond chests, reasoning that their contents, while not as extraordinary as the supreme chests, would still be immediately beneficial. Among his preparations was a small bottle of luck potion, now nearly empty. However, Blake was already brewing a new batch, which would take months to complete. Unperturbed by the dwindling supply, he proceeded to open the chests, hopeful for what treasures they might contain. Blake raised his neck and swallowed a drop of the lucky potion. System, Open the diamond treasure chest, he instructed. The system promptly responded, Ding! Opening the diamond treasure chest for the host, followed by, Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a secret realm. Secret realm? System, explain this item, Blake demanded further clarification. Ding! The secret realm is a space akin to a dungeon. The host can enter the secret realm at any time. Upon successful conquest, the host will obtain equipment, materials, or forbidden knowledge generated within the secret realm, the system explained. It added three important remarks. One, the hostile creatures within the secret realm may originate from other worlds and are extremely dangerous. The host is advised not to venture into it unprepared. Two, 
The hostile creatures are real. Upon their defeat, their materials can be harvested. The host has the option to either slay or tame these creatures. 3. The secret realm spans a considerable area and will require time to fully conquer. This duration aligns with real-world time. The host can enter the secret realm after careful planning. Note that the secret realm can only be cleared once. Blake realized this was a unique, one-time opportunity. Although initially skeptical about the reward's value, he soon recognized its potential. The prospect of bringing out all gains from the secret realm was particularly enticing. Given the system's hint about the strength of the creatures and the option to tame them, Blake, with his Hufflepuff sensibilities, preferred taming over killing. This way, the creature's materials could serve as renewable resources. Ding! Would the host like to enter the secret realm now? The system inquired. No, hold off for now, Blake decided. Ding! The secret realm has been stored in the system warehouse for the host. It is accessible at any time. Blake navigated through the system repository to a cloud-like icon represent Ing the Secret Realm. He locked the grid where it was located to prevent accidental entry before he was ready. This precaution, reminiscent of a lock feature in online game inventories, was something Blake had tested and appreciated for its ability to safeguard valuable items. After securing the Secret Realm, Blake turned his attention to the remaining diamond treasure chest. Open the last diamond chest, he commanded. Ding! Opening the diamond treasure chest for the host. The system announced, Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a white tiger. Ding! Would the host like to adopt it now? Blake's eyes widened in surprise. A white tiger? Is it the mythical one? Ding! This white tiger possesses a portion of a divine beast's bloodline, which is still evolving and maturing. Would the host like to adopt it? Overjoyed, Blake realized he had acquired a growing white tiger, one that would evolve over time into the legendary mythical white tiger. Adopt, he declared without a moment's hesitation. A dazzling white light materialized before Blake, accompanied by a thunderous roar that instilled a mix of awe and fear in him. Expecting to see a formidable beast, Blake squinted into the light. As the light faded, he was taken aback to find not a majestic creature, but a small, pure white kitten looking back at him. Blake blinked in disbelief, thinking he had seen incorrectly. Despite the initial shock, the system confirmed, Ding! Congratulations to the host for successfully adopting the white tiger. Followed by, Ding! The white tiger has recognized its master with 100% loyalty. Blake, still processing the sight before him, realized that appearances could be deceiving. The small kitten before him held the potential to grow into the mythical white tiger he had envisioned. Blake's face was etched with frustration as he exclaimed, The system is only at 0.6. How is the promised growth supposed to happen from such a young age? I was hoping for ferocious beasts, not tiny kittens. In a moment of exasperation, he declared, System, I demand a refund. Just then, Blake felt something soft brushing against his legs. Glancing down, he locked eyes with a small kitten gazing up at him, its face the very picture of innocence. Those large, watery blue eyes seemed to pierce right through him, and in that instant, all thoughts of ferocious beasts vanished from his mind. The kitten's undeniable cuteness had completely disarmed him. Surrendering to the moment, Blake scooped up the kitten, his heart melting as he began to gently stroke the purring creature in his hands. He sighed, Well, you're adorable, but I'm not sure how you'll ever help me in a fight against villains. The kitten, seemingly understanding Blake's words, let out a soft meow, its voice filled with a milky sweetness that tugged at Blake's heartstrings. It doesn't matter. Your cuteness alone is enough. Who needs to fight? Blake found himself saying, completely captivated by the tiny creature. However, the kitten didn't seem to take issue with being praised for cuteness alone and wriggled out of Blake's grasp. In the blink of an eye, the air was filled with a ferocious roar, and where the kitten once stood, a giant white tiger, towering at two meters tall, now appeared before Blake. The white tiger lowered its head, its human-like expression seeming to ask Blake, Am I not fierce enough for you? Damn! System! I was wrong to doubt you! Blake exclaimed, his eyes wide with astonishment and delight. You're both fierce and adorable. I couldn't ask for more. With that, he threw his arms around the tiger's massive head, showering it with affection. 
The white tiger, now named Bai Hu, responded with a contented purr, reveling in the attention. In that moment, Blake realized that regardless of its form, this creature was not just any beast. It was a companion that could offer both protection and the warmth of friendship. Chapter 157 Voldemort, do you understand the magnitude of a Dark Lord's battle? Blake was in high spirits. In a moment of excitement, he decided to unlock all the remaining bronze and silver treasure chests at once. Save money, open, he exclaimed, as a plethora of materials and gear spilled out before him, among which was a revolver. Holding the silver Colt Python, Blake couldn't help but admire its design. Despite its origin from a bronze chest, the revolver had an undeniable charm. This is quite the find. Muggle firearms possess considerable power, but they pose little threat to powerful wizards. A simple transfiguration spell could easily render these formidable weapons into mere fire sticks, he mused regretfully. It's a shame. It would have been fun to play with as a toy, though I could enhance it with magic resistance. A light bulb went off in Blake's head. He recalled the armor he had crafted for the bears, each piece imbued with significant magic resistance to prevent any transfiguration spells from turning the armor against them. If I apply magic resistance to this pistol, Blake chuckled to himself, twirling the revolver. The times are changing, you outdated wizards. Who needs a wand in one hand and a sword in the other when you have this? He joked, fully aware that a revolver couldn't replace a wand. However, as a surprise attack tool, it had potential. Concerning ammunition, that was the least of Blake's worries. As an alchemist, he could easily modify the magazine and inscribe the necessary runes to enhance the bullets. Exiting the room of requirement the next morning, Blake had no classes to rush to, thanks to the weekend. However, his appearance in the breakfast hall, cradling a small milk cat with light blue eyes and snow-white fur, drew immediate attention. Blake hadn't intended to bring the kitten along, aware of its eye-catching appearance and the danger it posed, far surpassing any cute creature on his ranch. Yet the kitten's clinginess left him no choice. Wow, what a cute kitten, Cedric was the first to exclaim, his interest in the kitten evident. Blake, when did you get a cat? Can I touch it? he asked, reaching out. The kitten, however, reacted explosively, glaring at Cedric as if ready to attack at the slightest provocation. Cedric, taken aback, looked hurt. It doesn't like me, he observed. Blake stroked the kitten which calmed down in his arms. It's not that it doesn't like you, Cedric. It just doesn't take kindly to any boys other than me, he explained, choosing not to mention the kitten's aggressive encounter with his roommate Roger. Cedric, still fascinated, inquired about the kitten's name. It's called White, and he's quite the formidable little tiger, Blake replied, just as Cassandra approached, eager to learn more about alchemy from Blake. White, the kitten, glared at Cassandra, clearly displeased with her proximity to Blake. Cedric couldn't help but comment on the kitten's protective behavior, while Cassandra, noticing White's fierce demeanor, asked, When did you start keeping cats? Since last night, Blake answered, avoiding further questions about his nocturnal activities. Cassandra suspected that Blake had found Xiaobai, the little milk cat, in the Forbidden Forest once again. It wasn't the first time he had found magical creatures there. Essentially, Blake responded vaguely. He couldn't reveal that Xiaobai was actually a gift from a mysterious system, not when he was opening a treasure chest in the Room of Requirement, a place where not even Baker, the house elf, was permitted. Thus, the true origin of Xiaobai remained a secret, with everyone believing the cat was simply discovered in the Forbidden Forest. Meow! Xiaobai protested loudly, swiping her paw at Cassandra's grandmother in frustration. She was upset that Cassandra was ignoring her. Cassandra, in turn, glared at Xiaobai. Despite the cat's undeniable cuteness, Cassandra felt an inexplicable rivalry, akin to what she felt towards Hermione. It was absurd. Xiaobai was just a cat. B. Lake gently caught Xiaobai's paw, soothing her. Xiaobai, don't be so aggressive. This is my friend. Meow! Bad woman! This is a bad woman! Xiaobai retorted. Blake, is she cursing me? Cassandra was astonished. She never imagined feeling jealous of a cat. Yet, it seemed Xiaobai could sense her intentions. While Cassandra rebuffed the advances of other boys, she didn't mind the company of girls, provided they had no romantic interest in Blake. Currently, 
Both Cassandra and Hermione found themselves unable to get close to Blake, thanks to Xiaobai's protective behavior. In their secret hideout, Blake was occupied with grooming Xiaobai, while Cassandra, Hermione, and Hannah sat nearby, their moods sour. Under normal circumstances, they would be engaging with Blake over their shared interests. However, today was different. They had identified a common adversary in Xiaobai, who had seemingly captivated Blake's attention entirely. Xiaobai, basking in Blake's care, seemed to be fully aware of the girl's frustration, even appearing smug about it. The girls were convinced that Xiaobai was deliberately flaunting her influence over Blake, which they found utterly unacceptable. As Blake continued to pamper Xiaobai, oblivious to the girl's disgruntled stares, he received notifications from the mysterious system, rewarding him for detecting their emotions. Xiaobai, entertain yourself for a bit. Blake finally said, placing her on the ground. Meow, where are you going? Xiaobai inquired. My friends are waiting for me. I'll come back to play with you later, Blake reassured her, patting her head. Hearing this, the girl's spirits lifted, prompting another series of notifications from the system for Blake. Meow, don't go, stay and play with Xiaobai, okay? Xiaobai pleaded, causing Blake to sit back down, much to the girl's annoyance. Cassandra exchanged a determined look with Hermione, and together with Hannah, they decided to leave the secret base. Blake watched them go, a mischievous smile playing on his lips. It seemed the system's rewards were unusually generous today. Letting the girl's jealousy fuel the situation might just work in his favor. Fifteen minutes later, in Blake's greenhouse, Cassandra declared, We need to unite. Hermione inquired, What are you planning to do? I intend to form an anti-cat alliance, Hermione declared with determination. An anti-cat alliance? What's that? Hannah asked, her curiosity piqued. Don't play dumb, Hannah. You know exactly what I'm talking about, Hermione retorted, her frustration evident. Okay, okay, Xiaobai has really crossed the line, even if it's just for ten minutes. Hannah conceded. Do you think Xiaobai is some kind of fairy from Eastern legends, that it has enchanted Blake? Hermione, having grown up in a muggle household and being an avid reader, was familiar with a variety of myths, including those from the East. Cassandra, though not fully understanding the reference to the goblin Hermione mentioned, grasped the gist of the conversation. I agree. It seems like Blake is under a spell. Does anyone know where Xiaobai came from? Hermione asked, looking for clues. Not exactly, but I think Blake found it in the Forbidden Forest, Cassandra replied. The three girls spent a considerable amount of time in the greenhouse, brainstorming without success for a way to counteract Xiaobai's influence. This is so frustrating. How can we be so troubled by a cat? Hermione exclaimed in exasperation. That's your problem, not mine. I refuse to be outwitted by a cat. Cassandra declared confidently. I will reveal Xiaobai's true nature to Blake. Ultimately, the anti-cat alliance grew to include not just three, but five members, with Cho Chang and Pinello joining the cause. Pinello, initially confused about the alliance, quickly joined after a negative encounter with Xiaobai during a dueling lesson with Blake. However, the increase in members did not bring Cassandra any joy. It only highlighted the magnitude of their challenge, as it seemed man or were under Xiaobai's spell. After a moment of silence, Cassandra voiced her suspicion. I believe Blake has been enchanted by the cat. The initial assessment suggests it's an unknown magical creature with the power to bewitch, she continued, clarifying their mission to rescue Blake from Xiaobai's influence. How do you know Blake is under a spell? Cho Chang inquired, seeking clarification. You might not know, but Blake has a preference for large and fierce magical creatures. Even his owl is a giant species, Hannah explained, providing insight into Blake's usual preferences. That's true, Pinello chimed in, recalling Blake's formidable pets in the Forbidden Forest. Unlike his adorable Sixu, Dabao, which he doesn't carry around daily. But this cat, Hermione added, her frustration evident. It's as if he can't function without it now. He even brings it to class, and it... It won't let me sit next to him. Hermione exclaimed, her annoyance clear. Cassandra looked at Hermione in disbelief. What? You all sit together in class? But aren't you from Gryffindor? How can you sit with someone from Hufflepuff? It's true, she sits on one side, and I sit on the other, Hannah confirmed, adding to the complexity of their situation. Cassandra clenched her teeth, 
her resolve wavering momentarily at the thought of confronting Xiaobai. Meanwhile, Blake was in the Room of Requirement, dealing with a different kind of problem. He was holding the Diadem of Ravenclaw, a horcrux created by Voldemort, and studying the intricacies of the soul. This research was crucial, not just for understanding Nagini or Harry Potter, but for his own curiosity. As he pondered potential subjects for his experiments, he remembered the Ravenclaw diadem he had found. The diadem housed a powerful, albeit damaged, soul, making it an ideal candidate for his studies. Without hesitation, Blake expelled the remnant soul from the diadem with a swift slap, causing it to manifest as a twisted black smoke before him. The soul, once belonging to Voldemort, was now in a state of shock and fear. To Blake's amusement, this action rewarded him with a bronze chest from the system, indicating the soul's incomplete state, and thus its limited value. Looking at the diadem, Blake couldn't help but mock, is this all you amount to, Voldemort? Suddenly, the system alerted him to an extreme anger detected, followed by a congratulatory message for his achievement. Upon hearing the system's notification, Blake couldn't help but twitch his mouth in disbelief. A bronze treasure chest? That's all? Just a measly bronze chest, you say? He muttered under his breath, his tone dripping with disappointment. Suddenly, a thick black smoke billowed out from the crown, charging straight towards Blake's face with a roar. Blake, unfazed, raised his palm and snapped his fingers. The black mist halted abruptly, as if stunned by his action. Do you have any idea of the damage a major battle can inflict on a once-feared Dark Lord? Do you? Blake exclaimed his voice laced with a mix of frustration and incredulity. The scene painted a vivid picture of the confrontation between Blake and the remnants of a dark force, encapsulated within the black mist. His casual dismissal of the treasure chest's value contrasted sharply with the dramatic entrance of the black smoke, highlighting the unpredictable nature of his adventures. Chapter 158, Voldemort, Am I Actually a Good Person? Or Dumbledore's Closest Comrade in Arms? When Voldemort created his Horcruxes, each soul fragment that split from him could essentially be considered Voldemort himself. These Horcruxes not only tethered him to life, granting him a form of undead resilience, but also effectively multiplied his lives. After all, any of these Horcruxes had the potential to resurrect into the true Voldemort. The necessity for a main soul was a moot point since they were all fragments of the same being. In the original story, the Horcrux within Tom Riddle's diary nearly succeeded in resurrecting a young version of Voldemort by using Ginny Weasley to open the Chamber of Secrets and sapping her life force. Had Harry not intervened, this young Voldemort could have sought out his main soul, merging with it to regain his full power. Therefore, Blake's confrontation with one of Voldemort's Horcruxes was akin to battling Voldemort himself. However, had Blake faced Voldemort in person, the rewards might have been significantly greater, not just a heap of worthless bronze. How dare you? Voldemort's remnant soul, manifested as a black mist, endured several powerful blows, becoming noticeably subdued. It was shocked to discover it couldn't voluntarily return to its horcrux, the crown. This realization came after encountering Blake, a seemingly ordinary first-year wizard who could effortlessly destroy a horcrux. Realizing the gravity of his situation, Voldemort's remnant soul became cautious around Blake, who looked at the dissipating black mist with a mix of anticipation and disappointment. Is this the end? I was hoping for more, Blake sighed, though he couldn't hide his satisfaction. Voldemort's soul, internally raging, attempted to manipulate Blake with softer tones and illusions, all of which proved futile against Blake's discernment. You must be a first year at Hogwarts, right? Then you've undoubtedly heard of the great Voldemort, the remnant soul tried to impress upon Blake. Of course I've heard of Voldemort, but why bring him up? Blake responded, unfazed. I am the great Voldemort, or at least a part of him, the soul claimed, expecting a reaction. Oh, was all Blake said, leaving Voldemort's soul momentarily confused by the lack of shock or awe. Undeterred, the soul continued its attempt to deceive Blake. Take me to the great Voldemort. He will grant you everything you desire. Find Voldemort how? Blake asked with a sly grin, clearly not fooled. Voldemort's soul, misinterpreting Blake's expression as greed, boasted about the supposed current state of the wizarding world under Voldemort's rule, 
questioning the status of pure-blood wizards, muggles, and Dumbledore. As the soul rambled on, Blake observed it with a mix of amusement and curiosity. It seemed the soul, having been confined to the crown for so long, was unaware of the true state of affairs outside. This chapter reveals the complexities of Voldemort's horcruxes and Blake's unique ability to confront them. Despite the soul's attempts at manipulation, Blake remains unswayed, hinting at his deeper understanding and strength. The interaction between Blake and Voldemort's remnant soul not only adds depth to their characters, but also sets the stage for future confrontations. The essence of each horcrux contains a fragment of the soul, frozen in time at the moment of its creation. This means that the fragment of Voldemort that Blake was confronting had no knowledge of its defeat by a baby named Harry Potter over a decade ago. Blake, with a thoughtful stroke of his chin, suddenly shifted his demeanor, activating his intermediate acting skills. I have no idea where your fragmented soul originated, Blake declared with disdain. But your words are repugnant to me. Voldemort's fragment was taken aback by the sudden change in Blake's attitude. Just moments ago, Blake seemed intrigued, and now he was hurling insults. The logic of the situation escaped the fragment. It was beyond any magic it knew. What do you mean? The fragment of Voldemort asked cautiously, its hatred for Blake growing. It had silently vowed that once Blake led it to its main body, it would ensure Blake's demise. After all, anyone who dared insult the great Voldemort was marked for death. You insulted the great Voldemort, Blake shouted, confusing the fragment further. It wondered if it had somehow missed its own line. Anyone who insults the great Voldemort must face death. So are you a mere fragment of a soul from some foul ditch, ready to face obliteration? Blake's words left Voldemort's fragment struggling to keep up. It realized, with a sense of irony, that it was being accused of insulting itself and now faced destruction at the hands of the boy before it. Wait! The fragment of Voldemort, now trembling with fear, tried to clarify. I am a part of the great Voldemort. How could I possibly insult myself? You lied. I never believed you were truly a part of the great Voldemort, Blake retorted. How could a part of Voldemort be such a vile, despicable fragment? Moreover, the great Voldemort is not as you described. You have insulted him. You are damned. Voldemort's fragment was utterly bewildered. It seemed to it that Blake was an admirer of Voldemort, yet he kept denying the fragment's claims about Voldemort's nature. The fragment couldn't understand how its goals could be seen as an insult to Voldemort. I did not insult the great Voldemort, the fragment insisted, though it lacked a physical head to express its confusion. And you claim you didn't insult Voldemort yourself? Blake continued, his excitement palpable. You spoke of Voldemort ruling the world, enslaving muggles, and murdering Professor Bolito with his own hands. Impossible. The great Voldemort is a noble figure, a close ally of the great Professor Dumbledore. How could he commit such atrocities? The fragment gasped. Despite its arrogance, it was aware of its own malevolence. It couldn't fathom being described as a good person, especially by a boy who seemed genuinely upset at the supposed mischaracterization. To be considered Dumbledore's closest ally was preposterous to the fragment. It remembered seeking a teaching position at Hogwarts as part of its plan, only to leave a horcrux in the room of requirement when it realized it couldn't sway Dumbledore. The fragment had no knowledge of what happened to its main body afterward, but it was certain of one thing. It could never align with the likes of Dumbledore. Blake's accusations and the fragment's confusion created a surreal confrontation, one where the lines between hero and villain were blurred by a boy's fervent belief in a version of Voldemort that never existed. Voldemort's remnant soul was plotting in the shadows, determined to continue recruiting forces to strike a fatal blow against Dumbledore, whom he considered his greatest enemy. The very idea of becoming a so-called good person or seeing Dumbledore as an ally was ludicrous to him. No one could understand his deep-seated hatred for Dumbledore more than he did. Yet amidst his denial, a sliver of doubt lingered in his heart. After all, his creation predated the war, leaving him oblivious to its outcome and subsequent events. In a moment of confrontation, Blake, fueled by a mix of anger and disbelief at the insult to his idol, raised his hand against the remnant soul of Voldemort. The slap shattered half of Voldemort's soul, 
leaving him terrified at the prospect of his imminent destruction. Realizing Blake had the power to obliterate him, Voldemort knew he had to plead for his life. Do you have any last words? Blake asked coldly, his face a mix of scorn and indignation. Voldemort, desperate to prove his identity and buy time, attempted to transform the Black Mist into his own likeness. However, his efforts were met with another fierce slap from Blake, who ridiculed the appearance Voldemort had assumed. How dare you call yourself Voldemort with such an appearance? A true powerful figure doesn't concern himself with superficialities like appearance. Voldemort argued, trying to justify the sacrifices he made for power, including his disfigured visage. Blake, unimpressed and still skeptical, demanded further proof of Voldemort's claims. The remnant soul, now desperate to survive and uncover the fate of his original body, conceded. I have other evidence, he said, hoping to convince Blake of his identity and, more importantly, to stay alive long enough to unravel the mysteries of the years he had missed. This encounter between Blake and Voldemort's remnant soul highlights the complexities of identity, power, and the consequences of one's actions. As Voldemort struggles to assert his identity and navigate the unfamiliar dynamics of a world that has moved on without him, he must confront the reality of his choices and the indelible mark they have left on the wizarding world. Blake's skepticism was palpable as he listened to the remnant soul of Voldemort boast about his vast knowledge. The arrogance dripping from Voldemort's claims was almost comical, yet Blake couldn't deny the potential value of the knowledge he possessed. Despite Voldemort's downfall, his understanding of dark arts and other arcane subjects was unparalleled. My knowledge stands as irrefutable evidence, Voldemort's soul fragment said, a hint of urgency in its tone. It seemed to fear that Blake might decide to destroy it before hearing it out. Although my memories only extend up to the day I was concealed within Hogwarts, my past knowledge remains intact. Allow me to demonstrate just a fraction, and you'll find yourself compelled to trust me. After all, who else in this world possesses such a vast repository of knowledge if not the great Voldemort himself. The corner of Blake's mouth twitched involuntarily. This guy's ego knows no bounds, yet he does have a point, he thought, begrudgingly acknowledging Voldemort's expertise. Your knowledge, then? Blake asked, his tone laced with a mix of curiosity and skepticism. Indeed, knowledge, Voldemort's soul fragment exclaimed, its confidence unwavering. If you doubt me, feel free to test me with any question, should I fail to answer, you may kill me, and I shall harbor no resentment. Very well, I'll take you up on that challenge. Blake responded, his interest piqued despite his reservations. Given that you're a remnant soul, you must have delved into the intricacies of soul magic, correct? Blake posed his question, aiming to probe an area of knowledge so obscure that even Dumbledore might not have full mastery over it. After all, if Voldemort's claims were true, then his understanding of such matters would indeed be beyond ordinary. Chapter 159. Extreme Emotions? Does the ultimate refreshing feeling count? Blake speculated that Voldemort must have delved deeply into the knowledge of the soul. After all, creating a horcrux requires splitting one's soul, and Voldemort, who harbored a deep fear of death, would certainly not embark on such a perilous endeavor without thoroughly understanding the implications. He would need to ascertain the side effects of splitting his soul and calculate the minimum success rate. If the risk of death from a failed Horcrux attempt was even slightly possible, Voldemort would never proceed, regardless of a high probability of success. Thus, Blake was making a calculated bet on Voldemort's knowledge of the soul, wondering if there was any aspect that Voldemort found particularly intriguing. When Voldemort's remnant soul heard Blake's question, it stirred with its own considerations. It recognized that Blake possessed methods to harm his own soul, indicating a certain level of expertise in soul magic, likely self-taught since Hogwarts offered no such education. Voldemort surmised that Blake had hit a bottleneck in his understanding and sought this interaction as an opportunity for advancement. Upon realizing the mutual curiosity, the atmosphere between them shifted. Voldemort's remnant soul, intrigued, responded, I have indeed explored the realm of soul magic. What specifically do you wish to inquire about? Blake took a moment before asking, How does one split a soul? 
what precautions ensure safety during the process, and what are the side effects after a successful split? Voldemort's essence visibly trembled at the questions, a reaction confirmed by an alert from Blake's system, indicating the profound impact of his inquiry. The remnant of Voldemort was momentarily taken aback, pondering why Blake would delve into such a topic. Could he possibly know about Horcruxes? Recalling Blake's earlier sinister smile and his unconventional focus on soul magic at such a young age, Voldemort couldn't help but see a reflection of his younger self in Blake, possibly seeking to create Horcruxes as well. Voldemort remembered his own past, how he had sought forbidden knowledge from Professor Slughorn under the guise of academic curiosity. It had been many years, and Slughorn was likely no longer at Hogwarts to guide curious minds like Blake's. Realizing the urgency, Voldemort decided to share a fragment of his knowledge, fearing Blake might dismiss him as useless otherwise. The division of the soul requires it to be in an unstable state, Voldemort began, addressing Blake's pressing questions. Why is that? Blake inquired further. Voldemort explained, the soul exists in a state of intangibility, embodying the deepest secrets and essence of life itself. It is beyond direct contact, whether by oneself or others, rendering a complete soul indestructible under normal conditions. Therefore, it cannot be split. However, when the soul is destabilized, it becomes vulnerable to division. Blake listened intently, absorbing Voldemort's explanation. The conversation delved deeper into the arcane and forbidden aspects of soul magic, each participant driven by their own motives, yet bound by a shared fascination with the dark art's most profound secrets. To destabilize a soul completely, Voldemort explained, it requires emotion. Emotion acts as the furnace for any manipulation you wish to perform on your soul. Any extreme emotion will suffice. Panic, joy, anger, sadness, and even extreme calm can be considered an extreme emotion. These intense feelings can cause your soul to shake violently. Blake pondered this concept and realized it made sense. He recalled moments of sudden fear that felt as though his soul was momentarily dislodged a testament to the power of extreme emotions to disrupt the soul's stability. As Voldemort observed Blake's contemplation, he felt a momentary relief for having avoided the topic of horcruxes. Even if Blake had pressed further, Voldemort was not inclined to divulge the secrets of creating horcruxes, a day, RK art that begins with murder and requires the murderer to remain emotionally detached to successfully split the soul and encase a fragment within a chosen object thus creating a horcrux. Curious, Blake inquired, after the soul trembles, how does one split the soul? Voldemort, visibly irritated by the question and the partial dissipation of his black mist form due to Blake's earlier attack, retorted sharply. Blake, realizing the cause of Voldemort's anger, had an epiphany. His own powerful magic could indeed harm the soul, sparking a promising idea in his mind. Voldemort, seeking confirmation of his identity, was met with Blake's continued curiosity about the safety and side effects of splitting the soul. Voldemort claimed there were no dangers or significant side effects, aside from the odd sensation of having another part of oneself. However, he concealed the truth about the instability and physical changes that come with each split, deeming these minor compared to his survival. Blake, sensing Voldemort's evasion, deduced that Voldemort was hiding the darker aspects of soul-splitting, likely to discourage him from pursuing Horcrux creation. Despite recognizing Voldemort's knowledge, Blake expressed skepticism about the state of Voldemort's soul, subtly hinting at his awareness of Voldemort's omissions. Voldemort, relieved that his Horcrux secrets remained safe for the moment, was eager to divert the conversation away from his soul's condition. He suggested that if Blake doubted his claims, he could seek further proof leaving the topic of his physical state and the years following his downfall tantalizingly open for exploration. Blake faced Voldemort directly. Since you've mentioned how formidable Voldemort is, I don't think he would find it troublesome if you disturbed him, right? It was clear that Voldemort harbored doubts about his transformation into a benevolent figure. Eager to confront the reality, Blake was determined to meet his true self and verify Blake's claims. You're correct. I'll take you to Voldemort later to see if you truly are a part of him, Voldemort conceded, noticing Blake's attempt to conceal something. This matter needed clarification. Without it, 
a return to peaceful slumber was impossible. Could you briefly explain what happened to Voldemort? Blake inquired, his curiosity piqued. As I mentioned earlier, I've been out of the loop since my time at Hogwarts, Blake replied, a sly grin playing on his lips. This Voldemort was unaware of Harry's prophecy, a fact that Blake found slightly pitiable, even if he was deceiving himself. Of course, Blake then launched into an elaborate tale about Voldemort. He described how, over a decade ago, the Otherworld's gates opened, unleashing hordes of monstrous creatures into the world. As the Ministries of Magic worldwide struggled to cope, the formidable Voldemort, alongside his Death Eaters and Dumbledore, united to vanquish the invaders. Despite previous conflicts, Voldemort and Dumbledore reconciled in a historic moment facilitated by the Ministries of Magic. Consequently, Voldemort was hailed as a hero, receiving the first-class medal of the Order of Merlin from Dumbledore himself at the award ceremony. Now revered as a savior by countless young wizards, Voldemort had ascended to the positions of Minister of Magic and President of the International Federation of Wizards. Following Blake's passionate narrative, the system chimed in. Ding! An emotion of extreme shock was detected. Ding! Congratulations to the host for acquiring a bronze treasure chest plus ones one plus one. Voldemort's remnant soul was left in disbelief. Blake's earnest portrayal seemed genuine. Could it be true that he, Voldemort, had become the wizarding world's leader, even receiving accolades from his former adversary, Dumbledore? The notion was absurdly comical. Despite his skepticism, Voldemort couldn't help but notice Blake's sincerity. The idea that Voldemort wasn't Blake's childhood idol seemed far-fetched, even to Voldemort's own remnant soul. As Voldemort grappled re with these revelations, a question crossed his mind. What do you know about soul-splitting? Nothing. It's none of your concern. Blake retorted coldly, though his expression seemed to scream Horcrux creation. Voldemort's remnant soul, fearing Blake's wrath and potential to destroy him, remained silent. Currently, Blake's peculiar abilities far surpassed his own. Seizing a moment of distraction, Blake forcefully returned Voldemort's remnant soul to the crown and stored it in the system warehouse, where it immediately fell into a deep slumber. Blake then burst into maniacal laughter. Deceiving Voldemort's horcrux had proven fruitful, yielding not only crucial information on soul-splitting, but also a substantial haul of bronze chests, thanks to his fabricated story. Perhaps the sheer quantity of chests compensated for their lackluster quality. After organizing his spoils, Blake proceeded to open the chests, eager to discover what rewards awaited him. Blake stood before Nagini, contemplating the complex task at hand. He needed to awaken the human part of Nagini's soul, a feat that required inducing extreme emotions in the snake. However, given Nagini's complete submission and trust in him, finding a way to elicit such intense feelings was proving to be a challenge. The usual emotions, shock, anger, joy, fright, seemed insufficient to stir the depths of Nagini's soul, primarily because of her unwavering loyalty to Blake. As he pondered over the dilemma, an idea sparked in his mind. Pain, he realized, could indeed be considered an extreme emotion. Yet, the thought of subjecting Nagini to pain, especially through the use of the Cruciatus Curse, was abhorrent to him. He sought an alternative, a method that could evoke an equally intense but positive emotional response. Observing Nagini, with her eyes closed and nestled within the essence of her snake soul, Blake found his solution. Painful emotions are difficult to navigate, but I have a way to harness the power of joy. Extreme pleasure should surely evoke extreme happiness, he mused to himself. With a sense of resolve, Blake extended his hand, enveloped in a powerful magical aura, towards Nagini. He was about to employ a unique approach, one that diverged from conventional methods, aiming to awaken her human soul through an overwhelming sense of bliss. Let the journey of joy begin. Activate at full power, Blake declared, initiating his unconventional strategy. In this moment, Blake's innovative thinking highlighted his deep reluctance to cause harm, showcasing his preference for a path that sought to heal and awaken through positive emotions. His approach underscored the complexity of his mission and his willingness to explore uncharted territories to achieve his goals. Chapter 160, Nagini's Awakening Pleasing someone is a complex task, as it requires aligning with their unique preferences, which vary widely from person to person. 
However, there exists a universal sensation that nearly all humans cherish deeply. This sensation, when intensified to its utmost, evokes an overwhelming joy we often refer to as bliss. For Blake, inducing this extreme emotion in Nagini was crucial. As Blake extended his hands, imbued with supreme magical power, towards Nagini, the essence of his magic began to envelop her snake soul. This magic, infused with the potent force known as the Horse of Love Killing Chickens, coursed through Nagini's being, causing her entire soul to tremble. A sensation of profound refreshment emanated from the depths of her soul, giving rise to feelings of bliss. Blake immediately noticed a reaction. Within the core of Nagini's snake soul, the human aspect of her essence stirred. A faint moan escaped her, a sound so delicate it could induce a blush, capturing Blake's attention and delight. Eager to intensify the experience, Blake uncorked a bottle of augmentation potion and consumed it. Without hesitation, he amplified the output of his magical force, causing Nagini's soul to quiver even more. Blake sensed a shift. Nagini's soul, previously impenetrable, now seemed as if it were a brick loosened from its sturdy structure. Seizing the moment, Blake approached Nagini's spirit, whispering gently, Nagini, wake up, wake up. As he continued to whisper, Nagini's soul abruptly opened its eyes. A flash of red in her pupils quickly reverted to their original pitch black. Looking around in confusion, Nagini's expression turned to one of horror. Waking up to find oneself encased within a translucent snake body would unsettle anyone, and Blake understood her panic wasn't directed at him, but stemmed from her own disorientation. With a snap of his fingers, Blake commanded, Come back! Instantly, both Nagini's snake soul and human soul returned to her serpentine body. Nagini lifted her head, seemingly trying to comprehend her situation. Blake stepped back, giving her space to adjust. He understood that after a prolonged slumber, one needs time to acclimate. Creating a portal, Blake summoned a tea table, two chairs, and a pot of tea, setting up a comfortable waiting area. He sat down, poured himself a cup of tea, and patiently waited for Nagini to recover. With Snape's potions class not until later that afternoon, he had time to spare. As Nagini regained her senses, her snake body underwent a dramatic transformation. The massive serpentine form began to shrink and reshape itself, the jet-black scales morphed into a black dress, and the fearsome snake head transformed into a human face. Moments later, a beautiful girl in a black dress stood before Blake. Blake's eyes sparkled as he sipped his tea. His theory confirmed. Nagini's inability to revert to human form and her loss of human memories were due to her human aspect being in a state of sleep, unconscious and detached. This condition paralleled that of an animagus who, without consciousness, cannot transform back into their human form. Blake surmised that many years ago, Nagini fell asleep and, due to a curse, automatically transformed into a snake. When her beast soul awakened the next day, her human soul remained dormant deepening the curse's hold. Thus, Nagini was unable to revert to her human form, living solely on her snake instincts. For thousands of years, she had slumbered like a snake until today when she awoke by her own volition. She could transform back into her human form. Clearly, she had recovered and had sifted through the jumbled memories accumulated over the years. Nagini faintly recalled falling asleep by the window that night, then drifting into a prolonged dream. In this dream, she was akin to an infant, lying in a meadow with her eyes shut, enveloped in warmth and comfort. Despite the haziness, there was an unprecedented sense of tranquility and peace, free from worries and nuisances. In this dream, he experienced neither sadness nor joy. It was as if the stillness of an ancient well was the unchanging norm throughout the ages. However, this long dream was abruptly interrupted. She felt an odd sensation within her indescribable and embarrassingly peculiar, shattering her serene state of mind. A long-forgotten emotion, joy, began to surface quietly, growing more intense by the moment. Just as she reached a state of bliss in both body and mind, she heard someone calling her name. Instinctively, she opened her eyes and was shocked to find her body translucent, still within the belly of a similarly translucent snake. As fear gripped her, her body regained its solidity, and her memories flooded back, including those of her original human life and her subsequent existence as a snake. It was then she realized that her blood curse had fully manifested, transforming her into a true serpent, 
until the boy revived her consciousness. Blake gestured towards a chair. Please, take a seat. I believe you have many questions. Nagini approached slowly, pulled out a chair, and sat down, observing Blake in silence. After a moment, she spoke for the first time. Owner. Blake choked on his black tea in surprise. He had anticipated various ways this conversation might begin, but this was certainly not one of them. He then realized that the Nagini he had previously tamed, though primarily driven by her beast soul, was still a part of her overall soul. Thus, after integrating the memories of her serpent soul, she also embraced the memories of being Blake's pet. Despite feeling it was incorrect to refer to the young man before her as owner, it was ingrained in her subconscious that her purpose was to follow his commands without question. It seems inappropriate to call you that, but refusing feels wrong, Najini expressed, her face twisted in conflict, reflecting the internal struggle between her human consciousness and her beast soul. Blake waved his wand, cleaning the tea stains off the table. You're a blood-cursed being, aren't you? he asked, noticing the pain in Nagini's eyes. Yes, I've remembered everything. I was completely transformed into a snake, and you awakened me. But it seems you tamed me in that form, she replied. Yes, Blake confirmed. I encountered you in the Albanian forest and managed to tame you. I was born with this ability. However, I soon realized you were not merely a snake. Your serpent soul was intertwined with a human soul. Nagini recalled the moment she awoke inside the belly of a translucent snake. Some elders around me recognized you, Blake continued. Having some basic knowledge of souls, I spent some time and managed to temporarily awaken your consciousness. As you can see, you're now temporarily in human form. Nagini remained silent, processing Blake's words, which aligned with the memories she had accepted from her beast soul. She understood her situation well. So, I will fall asleep again and revert to a serpent? Nagini asked, her voice tinged with despair. Nagini felt a wave of regret wash over her as she realized the temporary nature of her human consciousness. Yes, I've only temporarily awakened your human will. Once you fall asleep again, you'll revert to your snake form, and your human consciousness will go dormant unless I intervene to awaken you, Blake explained with a tone of regret. Nagini, feeling a mix of emotions, inquired shyly, How did you manage to wake me up? She was visibly flustered, unsure of what to expect from Blake, who, despite his size, seemed incapable of causing harm. It was an emotional technique that targets the soul directly. It's the only way to rouse you from your deep slumber, Blake replied, his voice steady and unembarrassed by the method he had used. Relieved by his explanation, Nagini's tension eased. Have a cup of tea, Blake suggested warmly, as he skillfully poured a cup of hot black tea for her. Holding the teacup, Nagini was transported back to a time when tea was a regular comfort a stark contrast to her decades-long exes, tense as a snake, where such pleasures were unattainable. This duality of memories, human and snake, caused her a profound sense of dissonance and confusion. As she grappled with these conflicting identities, memories of her time as a snake surfaced, the raw, sometimes horrifying diet she had been forced to adopt. The thought alone was enough to make her physically ill, and she found herself retching uncontrollably. After regaining her composure, Blake gently informed her, When I discovered you were a human, turned into a snake, I made sure to feed you only cooked meat, hoping it would be more palatable for both sides of you. Grateful for his thoughtfulness, Nagini attempted to express her thanks, but was overwhelmed by emotion and began to cry. Blake sat in silent support, understanding that no words could ease the pain of her lost decades. Once Nagini's tears had subsided, Blake offered her a glimmer of hope. Would you like to meet some of your old friends? They're actually my elders, and they deeply regret not being able to lift your curse earlier. Nagini, intrigued and hopeful, watched as Blake penned a message to Dumbledore. As she sipped the comforting tea, she noticed Blake's school robes adorned with the familiar badger badge of Hogwarts, indicating his affiliation with the magical school. Despite his youthful appearance, his demeanor was that of someone far more mature. Young lady, Blake addressed her softly, just as a blue phoenix appeared on his arm, ready to deliver the letter to Professor Dumbledore. Nagini, still sipping her tea, looked on in amazement at the phoenix, a creature she recognized but had never seen so close. 
Memories, heavy with dust, surged through my mind once more. Your name is Blake Green? Nagini inquired, her voice tinged with a newfound clarity. Yes, it must have mentioned me, Blake responded, his tone gentle. By it, he referred to the unique consciousness within Nagini, a fact she understood well. She nodded, her eyes shimmering with gratitude. Thank you, Blake, for restoring my humanity, even if momentarily. I wish I could do more, Blake admitted, his expression somber. But once you fall asleep and lose consciousness again, you'll revert back. Temporary is fine, Nagini interjected, her eyes brimming with tears. I truly, truly despise being a snake. Even if it's just for one more day. Blake's lips tightened into a thin line, a resolve forming within him. Then, I'll awaken you every day, just like today. Hope sparked in Nagini's eyes, a stark contrast to her usual despair. Is that really possible? She asked, barely daring to believe. Blake's smile was warm, reassuring. Your curse may suppress your consciousness, but I am among the rare few who can actively revive it. Okay, let's go. They must be waiting anxiously for us. Blake suggested, a sense of urgency in his voice. Suddenly, a circle of sparks materialized in front of Blake, captivating Nagini's attention. Although she had witnessed Blake summon this magic upon awakening, the sight still filled her with awe. Such magic was beyond anything she had ever seen. Let's go, Blake said, stepping towards the portal with confidence. They emerged on an unnamed island, right in front of Newt's cabin. Stab, the portal announced their arrival. Blake stepped out, Nagini by his side. Long time no see, Nagini, he greeted, his voice carrying a mix of nostalgia and warmth. The scene was one of reunion, of magic that defied the norms, and of a promise that offered a glimmer of hope to a soul long trapped in darkness.